So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Morris Federation series of talks and workshops during lockdown. And today we have a talk all about the Sussex bonfires from Keith and Heather Leach. So I'm going to hand straight over to them now. Hi there. Hello. Right, uh, Sussex bonfire. So, sorry we're a little bit late. I've, I've got a PowerPoint that we'll be running later. And I thought I'd be very flat and embed the links to the videos into the PowerPoint but uh, it doesn't screen share that on Zoom. So uh, we, we're probably going to start off with some technical difficulties straight away, but we'll try our best uh, because it's no point talking about a Sussex bonfire if you haven't got a feel or a flavour for, for what it's like. Uh, I'm Keith. This is Heather. Hello. <laughs> uh, we met each other through the Morris, didn't we? Okay. There we go. Uh, and... Uh, I moved down to Sussex oh, about 40 years ago <laughs> with, a, with a thirst for uh, uh, research into, into customs and traditions. And, and I was vaguely aware that there was something called Sussex Bonfire going on, but I had absolutely no idea quite what it was um, until I turned up Morris dancing at Battle Bonfire one day and, and realised I'd stumbled across this massive thing that happens down here in East Sussex that takes up virtually all of October and November and half of September if it gets half the chance, which is why you'll find it difficult to get some Sussex Morris sides to commit to anything in October and November because they'll always say, no, sorry, I'm doing bonfire. <laughs> but having said that, it's by no means the... Uh, uh, the domain of folk is for want of a better way of putting it. Uh, it's very much the, the common ordinary people who, who wouldn't dream of bit Morris dancing or being seen in a folk club. Uh, for various reasons, and we can come back to it later, I, I, was pers I, I was already running Jack in the Green and I was persuaded by somebody, uh, uh, whilst very drunk at Battle Bonfire one night, that it was about time that Hastings Bonfire was revived. <laughs> and there was a five pound bet on it. And uh, the bet was at Battle Bonfire in November. Uh, I was reminded of the bet in February and asked for the fiver and I said, bog off. And started Hastings Bonfire the following October. So it's been running for, this would have been its 26th year. 26th year, 26th. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bonfire. 26th Bonfire, yeah. Um, I was made president of the society for reviving it and uh, since then have got myself completely up to the neck in Sussex bonfire in every way possible, go to all the bonfires, uh, know everybody in all the different bonfire societies and I'm on bonfire council and so on. <coughs> By some kind of circuitous peculiar route, and it certainly was nothing to do with me, Heather, <laughs> who I'm married to, has ended up being the current chair of Hastings Borough Bonfire Society. <clears throat> and we've both done our own independent research. However, let's stop talking about that. Let's see if I can share a screen and show you would, what I'm talking about. I would just like to add yeah. that um, when we're talking about the season, because there are over 40 different bonfire societies around the county that's why the season is so large and so long and it does start at the beginning of september to the end of november every saturday and on some saturdays there are more than one bonfire celebration taking place there are too few saturdays to accommodate how many there are and it's um moving into kent yeah it's, it, it's a it's a growing a massively growing tradition yes, it, <coughs> and, and we, yet it's so secret so and, few and, people and yet, know and yet we're talking about processions of over a thousand people yeah and crowds of 20 30 000 people watching yeah uh okay right let's see if i can share a little bit of video <laughs>
Okay. Did you see that? Did that work? Way! <laughs> that gives you a feel of it. That was that was the start of Hastings Bonfire uh, 2019. <clears throat> Little did we know that was the last one we were going to do for some time. On, on that scale, though. On that scale. Yeah, we've done uh, other things, but 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 that was basically that was basically <laughs> it. I'm sorry. Um, okay, let's share the screen now again and get into the PowerPoint and and do the the talk about where that all comes from and what it's about. Can you see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so it's about Sussex Bonfire. There's a link that didn't work. Uh, let's uh, get talking. Heather, he I've, I've asked Heather to uh, tell me to shut up and join in whenever she feels so inclined. Um, she occasionally has a different view on it, which is good. We look at the research and we haven't both looked at it in exactly the same way. What I can say is that people going out on the street and having parties and having a good time and dancing around is nothing new. It goes back a very long time. And certainly within this country, it was any excuse for a party. People's houses were not usually the best place for a party. <clears throat> in general, they might have a party in the church, be in the biggest building in the town or village. But even that would be frowned on and the best place to have a party is on the street <coughs> and as part of any excuse for a party very often this be in england they would light fires and this would be at any time of the year they would light a fire and basically would get a drunk get drunk and dance around it and that's been going on for a considerable period of time <coughs> when uh, gunpowder came into the country it became quite commonplace to be uh, letting off loud, noisy bangs uh, as, as, as part of this uh, kind of celebration. So any excuse, and it, it's something that we've lost, uh, but it used to be certainly any excuse for a party and have a bonfire. So if anybody tells you it's all tied up with Sam Hain fires and all that nonsense, they're just talking rubbish. Uh, Yes, there might have been fires at that time of year, but there were fires right the way through. <coughs> that was sort of the norm and that was going on for a considerable period of time. And we're going to go for a very quick history lesson because this is where things start to move in across each other. <clears throat> and here we have the man who famously uh, divorced his wife, even though the Pope, the Pope told him he wasn't allowed to because he fancies someone younger. Uh, and when the Pope said you can't do that, he said, don't worry about that, I'll just start my own church. This was part of the Reformation and, of course, caused all sorts of problems and difficulties uh, across the nation. You've got to put yourself into a mindset of what it must have been like in this country at that time. We're not talking about the free nation we are now. This man had total control of everything. And if he didn't like what you said, he just had you executed. Everybody lived in fear. You did what you told, and that was that. Um, the closest I can even begin to think of <clears throat> is imagining if in the 21st century we weren't living here, we were living somewhere like Afghanistan or, or, or something like that. that. That kind of reign of terror was normal. Uh, he eventually died and his daughter Mary came onto the throne and Mary <clears throat> reversed everything and put everything back where it came from. <clears throat> this was all well and good but some people quite liked the reforms within the church but being an absolute monarch again if she didn't like what you did 
So you had to execute it. So once again, you had to do what you're told. <laughs> so basically the country reverted to Roman Catholicism. Um, and a large number of people were martyred at that, at that time uh, for their faith on, on both sides of the Catholic Protestant divide. Um, well, we'll jump rapidly across Elizabeth, even though she had a very long reign, was, was very, very important. <coughs> Elizabeth basically brought back uh, Protestantism and the Church of England. Uh, and uh, But once again, was an absolute monarch. And once again, you did what you were told. People were getting a little bit tired of this, and it seemed to be swinging backwards and forwards. And Catholics were feeling a little bit put out because they were not allowed to practice their faith. And as far as they were concerned, if they couldn't practice their faith, uh, dire and dreadful things were going to happen to them when they died. They would go to hell or whatever. And so it was it, it was very important to them. <coughs> so when Elizabeth died, James, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, King of Scotland, also became King of England. And... Uh, being the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a famous Catholic, uh, the Catholics thought they stood a very good chance of actually getting things back how they wanted. And James actually said, yeah, yeah, that's no problem. That'll be fine. Uh, I don't really mind what you are. If you want to be Church of England or Protestant, you can be that. And if you want to be a Catholic, you can be a Catholic. And, 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 and that's cool. Not a problem. I, I promise that's what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, <coughs> he didn't. He got onto the throne and then said, right, that's it. Um, I'm afraid that uh, I've changed my mind and we're going to keep maintain the status quo as Elizabeth had it. <coughs> you are not allowed to be a Catholic. Uh, and that's the end of it. Um, this then caused a bit of raucous and fracas amongst the Catholics. And I'll hand over to Heather who will tell you a little bit about the plot because I've realised uh -huh. I'm nattering away. Go on, no, that's all right. No, I was just going to say, yeah. yes, um, that <laughs> because James also came with a ready-made family, uh, that, that meant that the succession was going to continue to be um, Protestant. This is the reason why, or one of the reasons why, the um, Catholics felt they had to take action because yes, they were being persecuted and they couldn't see an end to it because of the, because there was already the next heirs and the next heirs in line. It just seemed to be um, never ending for them. And Robert Catesby, as you can see here, um, collected the, the group of plotters and they made this plan um, as a way of um, getting rid of the king and parliament. And they were going to take the princess Elizabeth and they were going to rule through her. That was the plan. And actually, Heather and I uh, spend our spend our time when we're not in lockdown, travelling around the country, not only looking at traditional customs, but on the way, looking at sites associated with the gunpowder plot. But that's a, yeah. that's another thing altogether. That's another yeah. That's another uh, PowerPoint. That's another <laughs> PowerPoint. We absolutely love it. Looking yeah. at the bullet holes on the walls and so on. <clears throat> they uh, they found a, a mercenary basically who was probably the world expert on gunpowder at the time. He had been working, uh, he'd been fighting in Spain, he'd been fighting in Flanders for the Catholic cause, and his name was Guy Fawkes. Um, these are the other plotters uh, and the, the, the famous uh, engraving of, of, of the plotters themselves. Little, nice little point here, Bates on the far <laughs> left of the picture isn't wearing a hat because he's a servant. All the others are gentlemen. Uh, so on the 5th of November, 1605. Tuesday. Tuesday. They had, they had bought a baker's shop uh, in Westminster. And in those days, the sellers of the, of the shops went underneath the parliament building uh, and they spent a, a large period of time bringing in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of bags of, uh, of uh, barrels of flour. 
<coughs> supposedly. And these barrels of flour were, 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 were to bake the bread. <coughs> they were not barrels of flour, they were barrels of gunpowder. And uh, these barrels of gunpowder were basically all stored in the cellars underneath Parliament to which they had free access through the baker's shop because it was the storage area of the baker's shop. <coughs> and the, the rhyme says it was three score barrels, but actually it was three dozen barrels. I think uh, the, the rhyme changed because it scanned better, score scans better than dozen, but it's actually three dozen barrels, 36 barrels of gunpowder. <coughs> gunpowder of that quality, it's been worked out by scientists since then, would have actually blown up, uh, given the flimsy nature of the buildings in medieval, uh, in 16th, 17th century England, would have blown up one square mile of the centre of London. Um, he was, Guy Fawkes was found in the cellars with uh, <coughs> this thing. This is the dark lantern that Guy Fawkes was found with. Dark lantern is much like uh, a miner's lamp where you've got, you, you can have a candle inside it, but it's not going to set fire to powder. Until you want it to. Until you want it to. <laughs> um, how was he found? Well, there was a tip off. Over to you. <laughs> the famous letter to Lord Monteagle, who that said um, basically, don't go to the opening of Parliament. Um, there's going to be um, a mighty blow um, and burn the letter. He didn't burn the letter. He ran straight off to Robert Cecil, the spymaster general, with the letter, and then. Robert Cecil did an interesting thing with the letter. Normally, when you have any conversation, uh, when you hear anything about the gunpowder plot, it sounds as if it all happened over one night. Robert Cecil actually sat on that letter, knowing that something was about to happen for two weeks, to wait and see what was going to unravel and what he could see in front of him and all the pieces together. And only when the time was ripe did he. Um, take the letter to the king and then say, oh, look at this. I've had this letter that says there's going to be this dreadful thing. What can it mean? And basically he played the king so that the king said, oh, it means something. Oh, gosh, something's going to happen at Parliament. We must send soldiers. <laughs> so they sent the soldiers on the Monday night um, for the opening of Parliament and um, the soldiers went round and they didn't find anything. All they found was this uh, chappy sitting there guarding a pile of firewood. So the soldiers went back and said, well, we, there's only this chappy with his firewood. Um, and that person was, a, was um, a person called John Johnson. And in fact, it was Guy Fawkes pretending to be this person. And they said, well, why is he guarding all this firewood? And they sent the, the soldiers back again and the soldiers this time uh, confronted this John Johnson and Guy Fawkes uh, tried to escape and then a scuffle ensued. And that's when they found the gunpowder piled up behind all this firewood. The, the, the plotters had all left London. They'd all legged it up into the Midlands yeah. uh, where, where they were hiding away, waiting for somebody to tell them that the deed was done. And that's where Princess Elizabeth was yeah. to grab her. <coughs> so, so this is the Dark Lantern. Yep. Uh, that Guy Fawkes was carrying. Um, as, as an anecdotal story about this, given it's all about Catholics and Protestants, I was, the <coughs> uh, first time it was put on display was actually in Westminster Hall uh, at Parliament, and, and I went up specifically to see it. Uh, and I was standing there looking at it, and, and I was completely in, enthralled by it. And I became aware of a very big man standing behind me, also looking at it intently. I turned round, I recognised the big man, couldn't work out who he was, but said hello anyway. And then as I walked away, I realised it was Ian Paisley. <laughs> That's interesting. OK, so let's dot lantern again. <coughs> <coughs> this is to give you an idea of, of what the, the barrels of gunpowder would look like. Remember, there were 36 of these. These are gunpowder barrels, they're empty, but they're gunpowder barrels at a at, at, at deal. Uh, and this gives you an idea of what that would be like. Um, Guy Fawkes was uh, was tortured 
and eventually let on where all these people were and, and what they were and so on. <clears throat> and they were hunted down to uh, a place just outside Dudley, whose name has completely escaped me. Stourbridge. Stourbridge. What's the name of the house? Uh, Hornby. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. We'll be back to you on that. We'll be back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know so well. We've been there. Uh, it's, it's now an old folks' home. Oh, uh, uh, Catsby, Catsby and the others were all holed up in there, uh, and it had been absolutely chucking down with rain. And therefore, they had all their gunpowder out, laid on the floor in front of the fire in, a, in an attempt to, to dry it all out, because they knew that the soldiers would be after them. They needed, needed it for their muskets. <clears throat> um, Unfortunately, they tried it a little bit too hard and they actually blew the, blew the room up that they were in. The soldiers heard the bang, worked out where they were, came and basically most of them were shot and a, a few were arrested. Whole Beach. Whole Beach House, that's it. It's now an old folks home. Yeah. Visited it and it's fascinating because it's got all the musket holes on the yeah. wall and so on. It's all right, that's on the other, <laughs> on um, the other talk. Uh, so... Uh, this is this is the king's warrant for Thomas Percy. Um, they were all catched and they were hung, drawn, and quartered. If they weren't killed, if they weren't already killed, killed by the explosion, I would soldiers. don't really want to go into the details of hanging, drawing, and quartering. It's no. really not very nice at all. <clears throat> they had their heads on London Bridge. Guy Fawkes famously, rather than being hung, drawn, and quartered, as he was being hung, jumped. To make sure he was dead before the rest happened or he was so weak he slipped yeah um one of the witnesses of of that execution was father gerard father gerard <coughs> father gerard was a leading catholic priest jesuit he was jesuit a... yeah he was caught and also killed uh, for, because, for for daring to be there and, and, and saying it was a dreadful thing. But the Catholics managed to grab Father Gerard and cut his eye out. And this is actually a Catholic relic, Father Gerard's eyeball. There you go. <coughs> um, so the king was saved. And Parliament. And Parliament was saved. <coughs> and it was decreed that... The nation must celebrate the liberation from the gunpowder plot in perpetuity on November the 5th. That law, until very recently, was the law of the land. It was the law of the land that you had to celebrate the gunpowder plot. That was, it would be against the law if you did not. Um, but don't go thinking about the parties that Keith started with. <laughs> yeah. You were also got told how to celebrate. You got told how to celebrate it. Uh, and you got told you had to go to church. And if you look in old prayer books, it's now been taken out. There is a form of service for Thanksgiving for the 5th of November and the deliverance of James I. But uh, it was never a bank holiday. No. But you had to go to church. There were sermons which were written. This is Lancelot Andrews. Uh, this is in Southwark Cathedral. Lancelot Andrews, <coughs> one of the important things he did was translated most of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, but Lancelot Andrews also wrote a lot of these sermons which were sent around the nation and had to be preached by law. And the people had to go and listen to them. After they'd done that, they would come out and they would go to work because it was a working day. Go to work. And then in the evening, they would do what they were told. They lit a fire. They got drunk. They danced. They had a party and they had a good time. As by way of celebration, because so that's what people did. <coughs> However, there were a lot of martyrs. Um, and. Although that we've got this celebration, I'd like to just sort of pay respect to those martyrs because one of the things that Sussex Bonfire has very much at its core is is remembrance of the people who died uh, 
for their beliefs. For their beliefs during the Reformation, during that period of time. <clears throat> there were Protestant martyrs under Mary, and there were Catholic martyrs under Elizabeth. Uh, and this is the Martyrs Memorial in Lewis on top of the hill uh, above the town. Uh, so, um, Lewis is the county town of Sussex. Uh, uh, county town of East Sussex. East Sussex. And it commemorates the 17 Protestant martyrs of East Sussex <coughs> who were burned in Lewis. This is the Martyrs Memorial in Mayfield and Rotherfield, which is a, a, a village in Sussex. Um, this is one of one of the first martyrs. He was uh, at a, a small village called Warbleton, <coughs> where he was the uh, church warden, uh, Richard Woodman. <coughs> and basically, um, basically, uh, he was church warden and he did what he was told. He was a good, pious man. And he did the service according to how Henry wanted it to happen. I was quite happy with it. And then Mary came onto the throne and said it had to change. And he was heard to say, as you would sometimes, I am sick of this. I just get it right. And now I've got to change it again. I wish you'd make up your bloody mind. That was heard. He was dragged off to Lewis and burned at the stake. This is the uh, war memorial at the top of the hill in Lewis. And just behind the wall, up the road, you can see a bus at, uh, and, and some traffic lights. And you can see a building to the right, which is actually Lewis Town Hall. Just in front of Lewis Town Hall, just up from the war memorial, <coughs> just in front of those traffic lights, is where the Lewis Martyrs were burned at the stake. And here on Lewis Town Hall is uh, the plaque remembering because the uh, dungeons where they were kept are, are still there. And uh, the, the steps going down the dungeon, so they were just taken up the steps in the dungeon straight into the street and burned. Lewis is not the only place with martyrs. <coughs> One of the things that Heather and I have started to do, and it's just by accident rather than design, we started noticing these martyrs memorials all over the country. And whenever we see one, I collect it. So I've become a collector of martyrs memorials. And this is the one in Rochester. This is the one in, uh, one in Sussex at a place called Town. All the ones in Sussex were burned at Lewis. Um, this is uh, on a pub in Brighton. The first Protestant martyr lived in the brewery. It's now called the Black Lion. <coughs> this is, uh, you can't see it very well, it's a fire back in, in Lewis and it's actually got the uh, martyrs on it being chained together. But uh, I've, I've also spotted them in Martyrs Memorial in Bury St Edmunds. They're, they're, I've spotted one in Maidstone. They are all over the place. But let's not forget, because I think it's important, <coughs> the Protestants were not the only martyrs. When Elizabeth came on the throne, there were other martyrs. Margaret Clitheroe, one of the more, more famous who, of York, who was laid on the bridge in York underneath her own front door and stones were piled on top until she died. This is the uh, memorial to, uh, to Margaret Clitheroe in the Catholic Church, just by York Minster. <coughs> this is <coughs> Thomas Pilcher, <coughs> priest of Battle. Battle is one of the big bonfire towns in Sussex. Thomas Pilcher continued to be a priest. He actually went to Somerset to run away from Sussex, but he was still caught and martyred in Somerset. <clears throat> okay, so we get, we'll go through those Marian and Elizabethan persecutions. 
<clears throat> we move forward in time. We've had James. James has survived the plot. And people are in a an interesting mindset. They, they have actually learned to hate and dislike Catholics. And they have bonfires. And they have these bonfires on November the 5th and they have these big parties. And they've taken to burning effigies <clears throat> on these bonfires of the Pope. Charles I came onto the throne. Uh, the bonfires continued. The problem is he married a Catholic called Queen Henrietta Maria. And this actually caused effigies of the Queen to be burned. There she is. That's, that nice little kid is Charles II. <coughs> um, these bonfires, um, well documented. This is Pepys who documented that in London on the 5th of November, fires were burned in the street all over the place with much raucousness, much drunkenness, letting off of squids and dancing. So, and lots and lots of burning of effigies. <coughs> the rise of the Puritans. The rise of Puritans. I'm going to grab myself a drink. Because you can talk about well, I was problems. going to get you a drink of water. Uh, right. You go. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I take um, I take more of a political view um, on on the importance of how bonfire came into being but the rise of the puritans took place at the time and obviously cromwell eventually um became the protector and um continued the uh bonfire celebrations of the gunpowder treason plot because um both the in the civil war both the royalists and the puritans could claim that god was on their side God had, uh, had saved the king from being blown up, but God had also saved the parliamentarians from being blown up, which is why, unlike Christmas and unlike spicy foods and dancing, the, um, the celebration of Gunpowder Treason Day could continue through the Civil War and uh, the nine years after that because of, uh, well, because God was on our side whoever you were and i believe this is really what made november the 5th big because up until then it was still any excuse for a party it's still any excuse for a bonfire and cromwell effectively stopped all those parties so november the 5th became about the only day on the year where you were allowed to go out light fires and get drunk and this is where i say it's political because it came from the authorities and the authorities will only allow what they will allow. If they don't like it, they won't allow it. And this is something that they promoted at uh, this time. Uh, There's an interesting little Hastings connection. This guy was the curate of All Saints Church, where I was this morning, actually. And uh, it's Titus Oates. And he actually put about that there was a... a a papal plot to bring down the the king there wasn't but it did contribute to the uh, fervor and excitement of bonfire that year as part of the reason why bonfires are so big in sussex he was actually pilloried in the end but uh, he, he kind of banned the flames for want of a better way of putting it um this is james the second catholic who basically was told to get lost and was replaced by William and Mary uh, to make sure the Protestant session uh, continued. Um, that once again fanned the flames and made the bonfires even bigger and of, of greater relevance. <clears throat> Pope burning became a very, very important and significant part of, of the bonfire custom and continues to this day in Lewis and Newick. The other towns in Sussex have ceased Pope burning. 
uh, they used to all do pope burning, but they they stopped doing it basically when uh, Catholics came back into the country because it just didn't. Uh, after World War One, really, when they were fighting together with Catholics and realised they didn't have six heads, they weren't a threat, they weren't a cause of problem. Um, and, and, and therefore, other than in Lewis, where, where they are consider themselves to be upholders of the pureness of the tradition, everywhere else it stopped. There's an interesting anecdote about Hastings, uh, when, when the Hastings Bonfire Society went out in 1880. Um, the new Catholic church in, in Hastings had just been built and it was surrounded by police and militia to protect it from the Bonfire Societies because they were expecting problems and expecting it to be burned down. The bonfire societies went nowhere near the catholic church they really didn't care they had no problems with it whatsoever there was however a riot on the other side of town outside the salvation army because they were anti-drink anti-parties and a much bigger threat than any old catholic now, so times had changed <clears throat> and in many ways this continues with with, with bonfire uh, right up to now, certainly there is always a background political context. It's no longer the pub, unless you're in Lewis and they insist on doing it because that's what they've always done. It's always something which I'm uh, much more contemporary, which I'll come on to. And I'd like to add in that during all this time, the use of the image of Guy Fawkes himself, because obviously he became known although Robert Catesby was the um, the brains behind the plot, uh, Guy Fawkes became the face of the plot because he was the person that was caught with the, the, the burning match. Um, so in political cartoons, in newspapers and pamphlets and things, the image of Guy Fawkes is, uh, through this time, used as being whoever the enemy is at that time. And that, that person and that figure changes from being the Spanish authorities, the French, the, you know, the American colonies, whatever, it, whatever it is that is. Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson. Uh, yeah. But the, the figure of Guy Fawkes um, appears. But uh, effigy burning in Sussex now is very tongue in cheek. Uh, but it, it does go back to, remember I said, Imagine that uh, in those days, you, you know, it's like living in Afghanistan now. And therefore, effigy burning, very powerful image. Effigy burning does have a huge political comment to it. And the kind of Pope burning that was going on in the 17th and 18th century is more of this nature. It hasn't become 21st century where we nod to it. Here is a Hastings effigy. Uh, I can't remember what year it was. It was whatever the banking crisis was. It's the banking crisis, three peaks, three different peaks. That's it's NHS cuts, interesting and very political. Bankers and politicians all with their noses in the trough and as i re as i recall yes. uh when when we set off the effigy of course the first thing that happened is fireworks coming out of their bums <laughs> before they then basically three massive explosions boom 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 and a massive cheer from the crowd uh, um because the, the i mean the up uh, with our effigies we have fireworks coming out of them and then we just blow them to smithereens and it's the swine flu it's when when we had it was also flu. swine flu yeah that's quite interesting yeah so we had sort of two things at once so this is the kind of nature of the i mean to go back through hastings what, what some of the uh, 19th century hastings effigies the butcher who first brought meat into town from smithfield rather than using local farmers was blown up in effigy the bus company was blown up in effigy for daring to put up the prices. 
in recent years, uh, in, in my tenure, uh, I, I, I can take responsibility for this because I was chairman at the time, we blew up the local traffic wardens. Uh, but that was great because they, they loved it. In fact, the traffic wardens came onto the beach and had their photograph taken next to the effigy. And the woman standing there saying, looks like me too, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, because it, it, it's tongue in cheek and, it, and, and it's done as fun. And people don't, though it has strong political comment, people don't quite understand that sometimes when they get very upset. I have been blown up by Hastings bonfire. Because not only can you be blown up, got a political comment because a mockery. it's bad and mockery, you can also sometimes be blown up because it's good. Yeah. yeah it, it's an honour. It's a celebration. It's yeah. a celebration. So uh, but I have been blown up in effigy and I was so pleased. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, this, is, this is a very bad picture. I'm very sorry. But this is, this is the top of the hill in Lewis and this is the 17 martyrs being burned at the state uh, in Lewis High Street. Okay, so we need to move forward in time. You've got this thing happening across the country. You've got this thing happening across the country and uh, it's happening nationally. Every November the 5th, large numbers of people mainly young, out on the street with fireworks and shotguns, because they were legal at the time, setting fire to things in mobs. The, come the mid-19th century, we've just had the French Revolution, and the authorities are getting jumpy, to say the least. And the whole idea of having people with shotguns drunk in mobs on the street is really not what they want. And therefore, they start to try and put... Oh, here's another effigy, by the way. I don't know that crept in. This is, uh, this is an effigy of a female Guy Fawkes from the early 20th century in battle. And it's actually of a suffragette uh, the guy concerned thinks it's a terrible thing and he blew up the suffragettes. Uh, here's a guy in East London. Okay. So we get these edicts coming through in, in the mid-19th century, 1840 or so. And basically they are saying, you are not to let off guns, fireworks, or anything else on the street. You will get fined if you do so. You are not to light bonfires in the street. You may not congregate. This happened all over the country. And uh, this law is still in existence. And I personally know people who have been arrested for letting off fireworks on the street on bonfire night. I have personally been cautioned on more than one occasion for letting off fireworks on the street on bonfire night. And I just say to the police officer, come on, it's November the 5th. You know that this is what we do. It's not any traffic, it's not a danger to horses, and he just goes, yeah, it's still illegal. Because that, uh, there's, there's this continual pull between the bonfire societies and the authorities. Because, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So this is the law of the land now. They are going to stop it. And in most of the country, that is exactly what happened. It stopped. In some places in the country, they went ahead and did it anyway. Guildford, Whittam in Essex, 
Lewis in Sussex and Battle in Sussex. Went ahead and did it anyway. The militia and the police came out in force and read the riot act in three of those towns. They didn't read the riot act in battle because no one actually noticed it was going on. Because it was a small town. No, it's still a small town. Still a small town. Yeah. But the riot act was read in Guildford, in Whitton, and in Lewis. In Whitton and Guildford, they went, fair cop, gov. That was it. In Lewis, they didn't. They waited until the militia had left town. They then went and piled a load of wood against the door of the local magistrate and set fire to it. They then all dressed in identical clothes, striped jumpers, white trousers and sooty faces. Which is why I took in, in Morris context, the whole black face thing. And when you start getting into into bonfire, the sooty face is really important because the sooty face was the disguise and it was ash. And basically the whole town went out with flaming torches and tar barrels and marched up the street and said, what are you going to do about it? And it was everybody. It was the rich and the poor. It was the gentry. It was everybody. And therefore in Sussex, it's become really important because to us, it's the freedom to, for an English person to be able to walk on their own streets with fireworks and flaming brands and chanting and being able to do so. And it's not setting fire to things. It's not causing damage. It's not because we wouldn't do that. It's not causing a danger to anybody. No, because it's not like garden fireworks. It, it's that's the bangs. It's the bangs you could hear in the background of the video footage. Hmm. I've got a shed full of bangs. I'll go and get them shown to you to prove I, I have them. Um, and uh, you know, so it, it, it's really, really important. And basically, the authorities couldn't stand against the whole town. And so they went out and they did it, all dressed identically. That happening in Lewis, word spread to the rest of, of, of the yeah. county because it, it happened in the county town. Yeah. And the, the following year, every town in Sussex was back doing it again. And the authorities never stopped us. But what's happened is, it's grown bigger and bigger and bigger. The striped jumpers and the black faces have been replaced by various forms of fancy dress. And I could go into great detail because these fancy dresses are all important. They're all significant. They all mean something. They all show various ranks within your societies. Um, and you, you can tell the ranks within the society. The ones that are wearing stripy jumpers are the new members and, and what you might call the, the foot soldiers. It's arranged very much on military lines, but once again, in true Sussex bonfire tradition, has total mockery. So technically, Heather is the commander in chief. Of, of Hastings Borough Bonfire Society, and technically I am some kind of big general. Uh, um, but we, having said that, although it's in mockery, you you will, on 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 Hastings Bonfire Night, see me walking up and down like a general, keeping them in order. And actually shouting out orders and so on, and but at the same time, laughing, if that makes sense. And I, this is that moment for me. 
I find um, when the people of Lewis changed and this sudden, suddenly it feels almost overnight, they became organized, well organized, and that blueprint was has become the blueprint and it instantly spread to everywhere else this this ranking and hierarchy um, that's so tight and so strong and you'll see in that that first footage we're not dancing we're not you know we're carrying torches but people are looking actually quite seriously we call it a celebration the overall thing is a celebration but people are not people are taking it seriously with what they're doing i mean you're holding fire you've got people with fireworks it's not that you're being irresponsible with those things mm. because of that level there is a high level of um responsibility and duty mm. within it but you've still got this this i mean i've got a, I've got a couple of instances about problems with the i mean back battle is the other big bonfire that has continued to go through and because it never went through, it, it's still doing things much in much older ways. Um, my, my, my joke locally is that uh, no one's ever accused Battle Bonfire of being organised. But it's just because they do it differently. They do it in an older way. But I'm allowed to say that because I'm, I'm one of their members. Um, but I remember a, a, a couple of instances of, of, of real old bonfire stuff. I was once at a bonfire and... The bloke standing next to me let off a rocket. Fine. Unfortunately, it caught the wind, skidded along a rooftop, shot along a gutter, fired itself up Battle High Street and landed on top of a police car. Next thing I knew, there were a dozen police running round the corner. I stepped forwards because they recognised me as one of the commanders because of what I was wearing. And they said, did you see who did that? And I said, yes. Could you point him out? Uh, he was wearing a striped jumper. He had a black face and a beard. And you look around and there are 30 men all standing there in striped jumpers, black faces and a beard. Because they knew that was the, the typical bonfire answer you were going to get. And then there was the year when the authorities decided there was no longer going to be a bonfire on the green in the middle of Battle High Street. There has been a bonfire on the green in the middle of Battle High Street since at least 1605. But they, before then. Probably before then. <laughs> but they decided it was no longer going to happen. Yeah. And there were no longer going to be fireworks in Battle High Street. Blanket. That's it. You are no longer going to do it. We turned up in Battle High Street. We marched up the street. As we got to the place where the bonfire should be, all of us randomly threw our torches on the ground. They just happened to be in the same place until suddenly there was a bonfire in the middle of Battle High Street. Fireworks then started to appear all over the place from private gardens, all pointing up in the sky so they all exploded over the top of Battle High Street. People were carrying red flares because they knock out the videos. On a given signal, I ran up an alley being chased by 30 police, I would guess, who eventually caught me and said, one of the commanders in chief, what the hell's going on? I said, you can search me if you like. I haven't got any fireworks. And I stood there and they searched me. I didn't even have a match on me. They said, what are you doing down here? I said, I'm looking for somewhere to do a wee-wee. Why are you all chasing me? They couldn't do anything because I hadn't done anything wrong. We then wandered out of that alley. And of course, in the process of doing that, I had actually led them astray 
so that all the people that had been letting off the fireworks had managed to leg it. So, and that's 20th century. So that's that kind of thing is still going on and, and it, that kind of fighting for tradition to make sure it keeps going. We now have a bonfire on the green in battle every year because we fought. Anyway, that's that. This is this is the sign in Lewis. Uh, at the end of the event, we we have what's called bonfire prayers. Uh, the bonfire prayers we, we'll have round our fire. All of us do the bonfire prayers, and I think you know them. If not, there they are. Remember, remember the fifth of November. We all know that by heart. It's God save the King, because it's King James. Uh, we all say that there are slight variations from town to town of the odd word, but we all know it. Uh, in Lewis, they still do verse two. All other towns have ceased to do verse two. Uh, and, and that's there. This is that night in Lewis I was talking about where they all turned out dressed exactly the same and were organized. I mean, totally organized with banners and everything. They managed to do that virtually overnight. So you get this, as I say, things have moved on and, and, and that disguise has now become costume. And some of the costumes are absolutely incredible. A lot of the bonfire societies have fancy dress competitions. Heather and I were once honored to be asked over to Lewis to judge their fancy dress competition. I've never seen anything like it. And um, the attention to detail. And each costume is significant. It, it belongs to a certain society. And for us in the know, we can tell by the costume what the rank of the people are. Uh, here's one going a bit further back, the, the uh, Cavaliers. These costumes, these are the ones that caused all the fuss, the Lewis Zulus. Uh, the Lewis Zulus uh, no longer exist because they got caught up with the blackface arguments. Uh, but they were they were astonishing costumes. Uh, this is John Hunnisett and his wife, sadly no longer with us. Uh, fortunately, I got to know John very well, and I've managed to record him because he was the oldest surviving bonfire boy in Sussex and had a lifetime's worth of stories going back 90 years, and I've managed to get him down, which significant so here's to john he was a great man bonfire boy since he was born until he died this is uh this is hastings hastings was famous for its giant guys uh and still is um we now have a giant guy that we don't burn mm -hmm. uh but they used to be burned that's what was being pulled in the original yeah, that's video. Being pulled. And here's, a, here's another Hastings guy. Here's another Hastings guy. These floats and so on. Burning crosses have become important within bonfire societies. In Lewis, they will have 17 burning crosses for all of their martyrs. That's quite a sight. And it's quite a sight. And uh, I've yet to be honoured to ask to carry one, but I think if I play my cards right, I might one day. I hope that's one of my Ooh. one of my bucket lists is, lists is to be asked to carry one of the crosses. Oh, golly, that's that's a real big bucket list. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, Hastings had no martyrs as such, but we still have two crosses uh, on our fire sites that, that we burn, basically in memory of all people who have died for their faith whichever side they were on. This is Rotherfield. This is their crosses for their three martyrs. These are the bonfire towns of Sussex as they currently stand. <laughs> uh, you can see to the left, to the west, you've got Lewis, to the east, you've got Backer. And these are the two centres from which everything has sprung out. And they're different in nature. Lewis is very fancy dress, very fancy dress. And all of the towns around Lewis are very fancy dress. Battle is very... Battle used to be the centre for gunpowder making in England. 
that's where all the gunpowder was made. So battle is very fire, big bonfires and massive bangs. And so all the towns are on, on, on the eastern side of the, of the county, uh, we, we, they're actually called the Senlac group, uh, are, are known for their massive explosions and huge fires. And all the towns to the west of the country are known for their fancy dress. But having said that, as, as with the Morris, there, there's lots of crossing over. And, 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 and as with the Morris, as you move across the county, you can actually see changes in style as you move across. So, so, so Hastings is very much a battle type bonfire. Um, and Seaford is very much a Lewis type bonfire. It is a massively growing tradition. I say 40 bonfires through the season. It's now creeping into Kent. You can see Hawkehurst at the top. That's in Kent. And it's still moving out. Tunbridge Wells are talking about reviving their bonfire. Lamberhurst. Um, Edenbridge have had a bonfire for a long time. That's in Kent. They're all around the Sussex border. But it's growing. It's growing into Hampshire. Uh, they've got Littlehampton over to the west. It's growing, growing, growing. And they say it's very much of the people. And when the town has its bonfire, everybody knows. I mean, they're all out. At Hastings bonfire, I would expect 40,000 people to be on the street watching and something like 2,000 people within the procession. Lewis, it's bigger than that. The population of Lewis grows four times over the, overnight. It's become such a problem in Lewis that they closed the railway station to try and stop people getting in. It is it is so big. Battle is massive. Uh, it is a growing tradition and every year a new bonfire society will pop up. Uh, this, is, this is Cliff way back before they grew big. The, the whole thing had nearly died out. Uh, Come the end of World War Two, it had nearly stopped. Cliff is one of the bonfire societies in Lewis. In Lewis, yeah. There are, there are more it, it had nearly stopped. Come the end of World War Two, in, in in the blackout in uh, in the blackout in uh, World War Two, uh, battle bonfire lit a candle underneath a bucket on their bonfire site to make sure the tradition continued. <clears throat> Come the end of World War Two, virtually every bonfire society had ceased virtually. But they still managed to continue. So this would be post-war uh, in, in, in Lewis, but there were people, still people going out making sure the tradition continues. I actually did some research with Gail Duff. We went around some of the old folks' homes in the Battle and Lewis area and asked people about bonfire. And they were all people that have been through World War II. And they all said, do you honestly think after all those bangs we wanted any more just for fun? But bonfires started to really properly revive in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And now in the 21st, 21st century, I mean, it's uh, 25 years ago, there was a big resurgence and it, it, they've just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. But they're, they're pleased to say that Hastings has an almost unbroken tradition, which is great to feel part of that. Uh, okay, this sort of old posters of things. Ago. The battle guy is of great interest because the battle guy is the oldest guy in the world. Its head is made from pear wood, and what they've always done is they've always taken the head off and burned the body until they had a body that was so good that they couldn't even burn that. But it is the, not a, uh, the Guy Fawkes effigy. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it. That, that, no, that's fine. That, that is that is the that is the oldest guy in the world, and there it is in 2019. And you can go and see it in the museum in Battle. And uh, I have had the honour of, of actually going up and touching it. <laughs> you know, which is really quite something. We don't know quite how old it is because they, they, they don't want to carbon date it. They don't want to spoil it. But it's a, probably a 400-year-old head. That's not a guy, that's the guy. Right, this is just the end of Battle Bonfire 2019. By the way, those are people that are in the Morris. That guy to the left is a certain Reese Bullman. Here's Tom. <laughs> 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 
Hastings colours. That's Hastings. Hastings gone by 2019. There we are. Uh, I could go on for much, much, much longer. Uh, that really was truncated, to say the least. I'm sorry. A bit of an enthusiast on this. I mean, I, I started as a Morris enthusiast, but this has, in, in many ways, completely overtaken. It's it's so massive, and it's it's, it's an honour to actually feel part of a living tradition that I've actually had to genuinely fight to keep going. You know, but that's really quite something. And, and, and the fight continues. Last year in battle, uh, because it was COVID, we were determined to maintain our right to have a fire. Um, we, we actually went out there and uh, spontaneously about 30 groups of six has seemed to appear on Battle Green and, and, and uh, lit a great big candle. It was only a candle, but we lit a great big candle and, and chanted the chant and then all went home. Any questions? Oh, there must be. <laughs> Hello, George. George is muted. Mute. Unmute yourself, I think. Can we do that, Sue? Isn't it? There we go. There we go. Hello, Keith. Um, that's a wonderful talk. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, uh, you didn't say that's the uh, photograph one of the photographs you showed there was the um, Stone in Oxney bonfire boys, and there was a there was a leading the procession. Second left was a traditional singer who died a few years ago called Charlie Bridger. Oh, really? Whose CD you can get from Rod Stradling. Well, anyway, it's Living Musical Traditions magazine, and next to him, right in the middle, is Andy Turner. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, what I'd like to ask you is basically, um, I looked at my own notes early before this started, and um, in Kent, where I lived for 30 years, they had bonfire societies. Yeah. Um, and they still have that in Lamberhurst, of course, not Lamberhurst, um, Edenbridge. So we went one year. And, um, and it seems to be a feature of Kent, West Kent, uh, bounded by the Green Sand Ridge. Um, between Edenbridge and Tunbridge. And um, there's not much north of Tunbridge itself. And it goes as far east as Cranbrook. Do you know of any other bonfire societies in southeast of England or anywhere else? Not really, no. I mean, and if you look at those parts, that, those, those are all the parts of, of Kent that are bordering Sussex. And of course, Tunbridge Wells was once in Sussex. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, the. Uh, Hawkehurst is, 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 is the big one and, yeah. and, and Edenbridge. Uh, we know of Lamberhurst, but they're quite small. Bodium. Bodium, yes, Bodium, but Bodium's in Sussex. Yes, but I was, yes, just, yes, I was, yes, I was yes. trying to think yeah. what else is that way. You, you, you've got, I mean, alongside these massive events, you've also got lots of smaller ones but the, in, within the villages. But uh, what I consider to be small for a bonfire would probably be what elsewhere in the country you consider to be quite big. I mean, the, the other thing is, of course, is the, the hugeness of the firework displays. Um, and each town will try to outdo the other towns with the quality of, the, of their firework display. And Hastings is one of the first ones up in the season. And I, I've, it, it, it warms my poppies to be standing there listening to the Lewis guys going, 
oh, bloody hell, we don't know where we're going to beat that. You know, that's fantastic, you know. And so you get this lovely intertown rivalry, but it's it's not nasty. N none of it's nasty, you know, and, and, and we'll all pile into the pub and, and go, great, these Spain guys, what are we going to do now, you know, and all get drunk as skunks as well. Oh, so yeah. Any links to there's sorry, a lot yeah. of questions. There's a lot of questions coming up, yeah. Yeah. Why is the Tristan so strong in Sussex and not elsewhere? <laughs> well, it's your fault, isn't it, for you people elsewhere? You didn't keep it going. Uh no, basically it, it's it's as I said, because in it did become uh, basically an illegal event, but in, in, in Lewis they, they said bugger that uh, had the riot act read and uh, have, have just continued ever since. And, and Sussex police have, have, have never, they're always trying to stop it, but the, they're not going to, and, and they know it. So it's now become much more a, a, a case of working with the authorities. Uh, he Heather was dreaming the other night about ha having the bonfire sag. That's the safety advisory group, <laughs> because we will actually lay out exactly what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, where on the street we're going to need to let off fireworks, etc. So that everything is covered and it's a it's a massive undertaking now <coughs> but, but but that's why because <coughs> sussex basically continued why do you think the tradition is I'll, growing i would also add to that that there's also the raw materials sussex is a very very wooded county and battle makes the bomb uh, was the center of making gunpowder so you could get get what you needed and obviously in those days you used to make your own yeah. fireworks anyway yeah the, the big the, the most wooded actually the most natural wood nat biggest area of natural woodland in england is sussex <coughs> so we've got a lot of wood <coughs> um so why do you think the tradition is growing so is it because people like fireworks and a good time or is there a more political reason i think it's because they like a good time it's a very much 21st century thing i mean certainly in hastings people love absolutely adore dressing up We've got Jack in the Green. We've got Bonfire. We've got biggest pirate day in the in, in, in the in, in the country as well. We've got all these things. I mean, absolutely adore dressing up and going out and just having a good time, dancing around, banging drums and drinking beer. It, it seems to be what we do, and certainly down here, it's just what people. I don't know about the rest of the country. I I, I, I couldn't possibly live somewhere where we don't do things like that. <laughs> but I I would say. <laughs> It's political. I would say my researchers have led me that um, anyone, uh, when we take to the streets, uh, we are making a political statement. <laughs> and the there are there are various theories that obviously having um, uh, celebratory days, having um, things like Notting Hill Carnival, where it's where in a sense all bets are off. Um, that's a kind of re release from the pressures of society. But at the same time, it does make the authorities very nervous because you don't, you never know what a group of people on the streets are going to do. Um, at what point can it turn um, unpleasant um, and become uh, a mob? So there is always a, that, there is always that friction. Um, and those of you that, um, have uh, know anything of the theories of the carnivalesque that the um anything that's that has excesses associated with it um with bonfire it's you know it tends to be you know you have a couple of beers but um, but you've got fire as well you've it always causes that um uncertainty but as soon as the authorities try to suppress it then it's going to make people come out onto the streets more which is what we're seeing what we've seen um, in Hong Kong and in Myanmar, because as soon as you, it, you know, it squeezes, it the people will find their way through. But I have a far more uh, political um, yeah. um, <coughs> lens on it. Uh, Mar Margaret Hunt has her hands up. Hang on, no, no, up the no. top, up the top. Uh, are there any links to bonfire to uh, Ottery? Okay. Yes, Ottery and, yeah. and Somerset carnivals. Very All, except all so. from the same route. Yep. All from exactly the same route. <laughs> it's just how it's worked in different areas. Uh, there, there used to be a, a, a bigger similarity with with the, with the Somerset carnivals, but in Somerset, the, 
instead of going down the fire route, they've gone down the light route, if that makes sense. They took on technology. And they took on technology. And, and, and yes, I've been to Summit. I, I, I've been to Somerset to see the carnivals. In fact, there, there are links. Uh, a lot, a lot of, lot of the, the, the leading lights in, in Sussex do go over to Somerset and we all know each other and, and, and drink with, with each other in, in, in the pub and so on. <coughs> so, so, so certainly there are links, but very different. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, I, I've actually got a Bridgewater squib here somewhere. Um, who was behind you when I went to see the Dark Lantern? Ian Paisley. That's what scared the wits out of me. Uh, brought my mind right back to the Reformation. Uh, um, bonfires further south in the Cornwall, not that I'm aware of, but I'm sure there are. Uh, there is, is there a, a website where all the dates are? Yes, if you, if you just type in Sussex bonfires, they'll come up. Although this year, we're, it's all a bit weird because we're still trying to work out what we can do if we're allowed to do and so on. <laughs> but uh, basically, you, you kind of know, you work from the November the 5th and you know that on the 5th it will be Lewis, the Saturday before the 5th it will be Battle, the Saturday after battle, it will be rye. And, and, and so th th there is a pattern. You know that Hastings is always the Saturday after the 14th of October, because that's the Battle of Hastings. There's this one here that was about oh, the uh, asthma air attacks. pollution. Oh, that's, a, that's an awkward one, isn't I'd it? I'd like to field that. Go on then. Yeah, well, yeah. not field it. No. Uh, no, very good point. I'm an asthmatic uh, myself, which is why I'm coughing and have to go again. Um, and it's... <laughs> uh, it's why one of the reasons and the other thing that we have with that because of the loud fireworks is the dog owners as well in the area have to um, uh, be aware. So that's another reason why all dates are publicised so that you can get away from it if you don't like it in the same way if you don't want, you know, um, as a, you, know you know, you want to avoid the road closures for the Lord's Mayor show. You don't want uh, to be party to any other substances at the Notting Hill Carnival, whatever it is. The thing is, if you don't, it, yeah, if you keep away from it, if it's publicised, if you don't know it's going to happen, you don't know the nature of it, that's when you get um, caught out. So we always will publicise uh, so that people know exactly what's happening. And there was another one that was on that line um no nope, i'll come back to it oh it was about guy fawkes oh uh, yeah, yeah but don't no, no, guy, guy fawkes in no, york yeah no, absolutely no, of, of course, course not. not he came from york <laughs> um uh, be, being bonfire fanatics we've actually been up to scotland where guy fawkes lived yep. seen his house and yeah uh, <clears throat> and, and, and all the rest of it in, in fact a little plug heather has written a one woman play called guy fawkes mother which should be at brighton festival this year if you want to go and see it. it's very good <laughs> uh, we've got Margaret Hunt's been waiting hey, we, we're trying to find Margaret oh no, just on uh, Margaret could you unmute yourself and ask your question please oh, Margaret hello yes, thank you for waiting, sorry we couldn't see you couldn't find I'll you. put it on chat now as well thank because you. Um, oh, right. yeah. I, I've been involved in a Skinning Grove bonfire now for over 30, 30 years. Um, but it, they tend to have themes that are more um, not as political. They are political in some cases, but not as controversial as some of the effigy burning that happens in Lewis. Um, and I wondered about the status of your funding to fund such large displays because um we do get funding we do tremendous amount of self fundraising through charitable through uh fundraising in the village um i'm a i'm a volunteer that goes up there by the way because i worked in middlesbrough for a while but i've stayed in association with the bonfire people but the people in the village fundraise do a tremendous amount of work. There's a terrific amount of local support for it. We get about 5,000 people there. Uh, well, it's a thanks. small village. and uh, But the displays are very fantastical. They're fabulous. Um, but we do get some funding from local councils. Um, 
you'd have to ask the bonfire committee where else but there, i think there is some arts council funding as well and i just wondered about your funding for putting on such tremendously large firework displays well heather will give you the precise numbers but we are self-funded one of the things that sussex bonfire you will but uh, is that we the collections on the night all go to local charities yeah and in 2019 at Bonfire Council, we actually put it all together how much we've collected. And in 2019, 40,000 pounds was collected mm. across Sussex for local charities. Heather will now tell you about how Hastings is funded and what the big numbers are. Oh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the numbers are <coughs> painful in terms of, um, I have an image in my head for the, the things we do when we're collecting, not just for Bonfire, but for us, other charity things, is just how many buckets, how many people have to go out with the collecting bucket. Oh, yeah. There is no subsidy for Sussex Bonfire. There is no Arts Council money for Sussex Bonfire because it's an indigenous um, event. It's not an arts event. Therefore, it is not... Um, able to get any funding on having said that we have been able to in hastings get on occasion two thousand pounds to pay for the effigy by um absolutely getting away with as you can hear what i'm about to say by um squeezing through uh, that it is an art installation on the beach that we blow up mm. so there's in the effigy there are two thousand pounds worth of fireworks just about to to put that so the fireworks display is somewhere between in hastings is somewhere between four and six thousand pounds and our fireworks crew uh put on displays through the year for weddings bar mixers funerals you name it whatever you want book us now because that is how we get the, the money to pay for the um, um, fireworks on the beach. Um, but then the costs of the, uh, in Hastings, we have the largest single procession in the county, therefore in, in the, the world, world <laughs> which basically means that there is no other bonfire celebration happening on our night so every other bonfire society comes into the procession with, with ours, plus any uh, drumming groups, plus any of the other uh, groups that we have, plus we have the dignitaries. You heard at the beginning, you might have heard the clanging of the bells. We have the national town criers um, all assembling they are procession as well. Blah, blah, blah. But um, we've basically got this massive procession with people carrying fire torches so the uh, you know you're talking four thousand pounds insurance money for the procession and the bonfire on the beach and that's without then paying for the security on the road closures etc etc and it's all self-funded margaret you're muted again margaret margaret you need to unmute Mute. i would like to come back just on one point that you said the Skinny Grove Bonfire, I would say, is very much Indigenous. Um, it's grown from, I was there at the first one in the 1980s, and it's grown from a very small event into that's gradually involved the whole village. And it's become, it is very much um, an Indigenous event there as well. What? Brilliant. Please tell us how you got the money. But we don't want to take money from you. Yeah. But please tell us <laughs> where this I mean, you, usually. golden pot of funds is. We would love Well, it. I mean, it's not. by the, the amount of fundraising that goes on in the village is tremendous. Yeah. I mean, it by no means covers yeah, absolutely. the whole I mean, that, that's how thing. it's done. Usually it's have, a look at the, have a look at the website. <laughs> Local yeah, pubs, they, they, local pubs do very well, and they're usually very keen to put money in. But this year, we're not quite sure if we can go and ask them. No. Yeah. You know, so our, our major sources of funding have kind of dried up because they haven't been existing. Yeah. <clears throat> I suspect that we're probably going to have to go to the town, to the people of the town, and go help. 
and I would be surprised if the town didn't just pull together and said, of course they're going to support our own bonfire, it's important. Yeah, it is like you want to have, it's exactly as you've described in Skinning Grove, <laughs> it is an expression of your community's um, ability to do that. One long standing bonfire member once said to me, um, well, it's not a, an achievement um, and we haven't been working together. If it hasn't been a difficult thing to put together, then you don't get the sense of achievement. I remember once the guy who was the secretary of the club we really once met came up to me and said, uh, I'm absolutely astonished by you lot, the amount that you do. And, says, and, and, and the thing is, he says, you are all ages from big to small and you're from across society. You've got everybody from magistrates you know, to, to fishermen and everything in between and you're all putting together and I said yeah of course we're the town and that's what we do and it, it, it is a part of, of, of borough pride that we, we will try and outdo Lewis <laughs> there's a couple of nice comments that people have written they're not really questions but uh, in the chat no, you're right about St. Peter's School. Um, yeah, we visited there too. <laughs> which, which used to be up by the uh, Minster and is now um, at a place called Horsfields and is just further out. You're right that the school does not allow <coughs> the burning of Guy Fawkes. Um, and I it was when I discovered, and this is decades ago, that, um, that obviously after Guy Fawkes had been killed, that actually his family was still uh, around and wondered how on earth they, they would have coped with that. Um, so look out for her play, Guy Fawkes Mother. Any other questions? Sorry, we've gone on a bit. Oh, yes. I wish you did still have your 1969 notes of, of that. Hmm. Okay, so, but uh, yeah, we're just running, just running a little bit over. We started a bit late, so we can take another question from Coral. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, just what you were saying about the Fork's family, I was quite surprised. We have, I think it was our weather in the west here. Um, I'm in near Bath in um, Wiltshire, and they were talking about something, and he said, um, his was a great, 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 and his name is Hawks. I can't remember his Christian name, but I hadn't realised. So he's one of our weathermen. And so there's still somebody in the Hawks family here. Yes, Chris Hawks. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, yeah. Would you really want to have that name? Uh, he's quite proud of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine now, but. So they were teasing him about something, yes. Uh, anyway, thank you. It's been a fascinating talk. Right. Sorry, I'm... thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time. So um, can we just everyone unmute themselves and give a big round of applause to Keith and Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to donate to Hastings Borough Bonfire Society, then uh, the information is in the <laughs> emails. <also. laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you at the next talk. Lovely. Bye. Lovely afternoon. Thank you. Ah.